I think it's time to start uh, for the last lecture of Professor Otto. Thank you. So, um, right, so let's, uh, let me recap what, um, so, uh, uh, so that's the, um, that's the uh, that's the main theorem of my my course, uh, which is uh, which is this uh, this conditional uh, convergence of the uh, thresholding scheme, um, which is written here, uh, to uh, uh, to mean curvature flow, and uh, we have uh, we have two types. I mean, Tim Laux and I have two types of results. One uh, is uh, uh, more in the spirit of. Uh, Lookhouse and Stutznecker, but does not contain uh, even the global dissipation inequality. And, uh, and there is the second result, which uh, uh, contains uh, not just the global uh, dissipation inequality, but uh, the family of local dissipation inequalities, which uh, according to Bracke uh, are sufficient to characterize uh, mean curvature flow. Uh, at least in, in the sense that if, uh, if you knew uh, that uh, your limiting evolution was coming from a smooth evolution, then this condition is equivalent to uh, uh, mean curvature flow. But of course, in general, as you know, uh, uh, there might be non-uniqueness and, uh, uh, and uh, singularities, and uh, so, uh, so this is just uh, a convenient weak notion of solution. So it's a notion of solution that's built on the dissipation inequality. And since the dissipation inequality, the global dissipation inequality is just a, a single inequality, it could never be enough to characterize an infinite dimensional evolution equation. But, uh, but it turns out this uh, localized version uh, does. And, um, but of course, uh, uh, it is uh, for it to really characterize uh, mean curvature flow in the sense, so normal velocity is equal to one half of the mean curvature, uh, you of course need everywhere the right constants. So, uh, uh, so this constant one half is exactly the right constant, comes from the two here, and, uh, and that's, the, that's the constant which you need there. Otherwise, it wouldn't be, uh, it would fail to characterize it. It would be a completely floppy, uh, floppy condition. So, uh, so keeping track of the constants is the, uh, is the right thing. And, uh, um, and as I mentioned at the very beginning uh, uh, of, the, uh, of my lecture, uh, whenever you have a minimizing movement scheme, uh, you, have, uh, you have an easy uh, uh, a priori estimate or uh, something which almost looks like the dissipation inequality. Uh, which uh, is the basis for all a priori estimates, which tells you that E H of uh, chi n um, or capital N plus the sum uh, little n from one to infinity, uh, one over two H uh, D H square chi n chi n minus one is less or equal than E H of chi zero. So that you get always for free uh, for, for a minimizing movement scheme. And as I mentioned in, 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 in the first hour, you just get it from taking the previous step as a competitor. But this does not turn in the limit into uh, uh, the right dissipation inequality. It misses the dissipation inequality by a factor of two or one half. And therefore, uh, life is not that easy. You cannot use, I mean, this is extremely useful and we use it a lot to gain a priori estimates, to gain that the curvature is square integrable, that the normal velocity is square integrable, that the, uh, uh, that the parameter stays bounded or in fact is decaying. You get all of these a priori informations from that simple estimate. So that's of course a big power of uh, a minimizing movement scheme that you get an, an important a priori estimate for free but it, by a factor of one half, it fails to capture uh, the right dissipation inequality, right? So, uh, so that's, that's in a certain sense the leitmotif that, uh, 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 that you need to do more. And, uh, um, and the, uh, it's the, uh, I hope I'm going backwards, yes. 
And it's really uh, uh, the merit of the work of De Giorgi that he showed a path how, in a completely abstract framework, how to, uh, uh, how to go, in a certain sense, from this uh, uh, only seemingly optimal estimate to a truly optimal estimate. How to recover uh, uh, the, missing, the missing second half in the dissipation inequality. And he, uh, and he does that by introducing, uh, introducing this variational interpolation, which is kind of a very general tool. And I, I think, I've, I mean, I, don't th I know that I've shown you the proof. So uh, that was an el elementary, uh, elementary uh, elegant uh, argument. And, uh, and, and that's precisely uh, the main abstract tool we're using here to, uh, uh, to, get, the right, uh, to get the right inequality. So that's the... Uh, Yes. Okay. So now I had uh, several glasses of wine. I can even hear you worse. Uh, so I just heard Angren Taylor Wong and. Uh, so so uh, so the uh, the Armgren Taylor Wong scheme. Which uh, um, let me uh, erase this here. So that uh, I think that uh, that work uh, uh, was uh, was a very influential work, and uh, I think at least uh, uh, Luigi Ambrosio told me that this was probably uh, kind of had inspired uh, uh, Georgi to think about this in more general terms. And, uh, and the Angren Taylor Wong scheme uh, runs as follows. So, um, Taylor Wong uh, from 93. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, you say that your set um, at time step n minimizes. Uh, the uh, interfacial um, area of the boundary plus uh, a squared distance uh, to the previous set. And here, uh, the right, uh, the notion of distance they proposed, written in a kind of elementary way, is the following. You look at the symmetric difference uh, between your uh, nominal set and the uh, uh, previous set, and you integrate. Uh, the um, distance, the unsigned distance function to the previous set. That's the, uh, uh, that's the, um, uh, uh, and, and because we're, uh, we're looking here at the factor of, uh, we're looking here at 2v is equal to h, uh, I need to put a 4 here, I think. So that's their scheme, and you can convince yourself that in the graph case, uh, uh, and if you have little slope, this turns into the L2 gradient flow of the Dirichlet integral as it's supposed to be. So, uh, and, uh, and so what's known for this scheme is that, I mean, the same type of conditional convergence result which uh, Tim Lauchs and I had before, which I uh, named uh, theorem uh, two. Uh, to my knowledge, there is no analog of the theorem which I'm presenting now known for this scheme. Uh, I think that's a genuine advantage of the thresholding scheme. I mean, first of all, I mean, what's the difference? So, uh, of course, uh, uh, I mean, this, I think this scheme is historically very influent, but it doesn't have much of a numerical significance. This scheme has a numerical significance. And I think theoretically one's even better off in the sense that uh, here at least, uh, I mean, at least I see uh, how to get the, uh, also the, uh, uh, the dissipation inequalities and even the local ones where I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't know how to do that for this one. I mean, other people may, but I don't. Sorry, yeah. It's not so clear because here I'm not, I mean, uh, that's not so clear to me. I'm not localizing a variational problem. 
I'm localized, I'm, I'm, I'm giving a different, I mean, the thresholding scheme a priori doesn't have any variational structure. It's kind of this pointwise scheme. And, uh, and therefore, it turns out that it satisfies uh, kind of a whole family of variational principles. Whereas, whereas here, it's not so clear, I mean, when you start out with a variational principle, it's not so clear how to localize that in a suitable way. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm, so I, I haven't given you the proof of lemma six. I'm not doing that by starting from this variation problem and modifying the variation problem. I'm really starting from here. So, I mean, I'm start, I mean like in lemma two, I derived this from this, and, uh, and lemma six is not derived from the outcome of lemma two, but it's derived as in lemma two from this here. So, uh, so I wouldn't, I mean, that, that's really, in a certain, I, I, what I think is, is an advantage of the thresholding scheme that it's, uh, in a certain sense, so natural that it does fit, in the th <clears throat> does fit into this variational framework, framework, but it fits into the variation pr framework in many different ways. And, uh, and here we picked one which is convenient for us. More questions? Okay, so uh, now you have the uh, you have the choice. So uh, uh, I can um, either uh, kind of finish the proof of lemma six. Uh, I can go to uh, to the uh, the things of uh, of the first. So yeah, let me let me remind. So so uh, let's continue with the recap. Um, okay, so. Uh, Right, so uh, the, main, uh, uh, the main merit of... Uh, <laughs> that gives you the... Yeah. Yeah. So, so in a certain sense, uh, I mean this. Uh, um, the term which you're the term which you're adding here. I mean, it has to. Um, it has to. Uh, um, the important thing about the metric term is such that, from an infinitesimal point of view, it has to act. Uh, like the uh, like the metric tensor, which uh, you would like to uh, which you would like to write down. And now I think I need the factor uh, I need the factor of four because of uh, this two uh, two v here. So it has to act like uh, uh, like this tensor. So in other words, um, if um, if in a certain sense uh, uh, your omega can be seen as let me write it uh, in a very uh, sloppy way, as perturbing this set with a normal velocity v, then this expression has to uh, behave like with a, uh, with, a, uh, with a 1 over 2h. That's the, uh, that's the, uh, that would be the Euclidean analog of, uh, I mean, that tells you, it's this property of this expression which tells you that you shouldn't be surprised that this converges to mean curvature flow. I don't know whether that answers your question. Perhaps I didn't understand your questions. 
Okay, so, so, uh, so of course, uh, you know, I mean, one could write down many different expressions here. It's in a, it's in a certain sense, uh, I mean, if I, if I were to use a kind of a, um, a more abstract point of view, um, so, so you have a, you have a, uh, you have a uh, you have a Riemannian uh, you have a Riemannian manifold infinite dimensional Riemannian manifold with the with the metric tensor, and uh, the metric tensor gives rise to an induced distance in the large. Okay, so this terribly fails in our case, but let's for a moment ignore that this fails. So uh, whenever you have this structure, uh, you can write down uh, this natural time discretization of uh, of a gradient flow, which uh, Assumes uh, this uh, this form, right? I mean, uh, uh, it's quite it's gotten quite popular where this you know in cases where this here is the Wasserstein distance and so on, but uh, but uh, it started earlier, right? And uh, so uh, uh, so that's uh, uh, that's what you would like to write down, and uh, but it's clear that you're not forced to put the induced distance here. You can put anything there which has the same local behavior, which quadratically, from a quadratic point of view, has the same behavior. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're writing down, because they couldn't write, I mean, because of uh, the observation of uh, uh, Michio and Mumford, which uh, came later, but which they must have been aware of. Uh, uh, they, they cannot write down the induced distance anyway. It would be terribly non-explicit. And, uh, and so they come up with a proxy. And, uh, and because they, because they, uh, all they need is that uh, uh, that close. I mean, in the regime when these two points are close, what they write down should be quadratically, uh, quadratically similar. I mean, I could even make it more explicit. Think of the Riemannian case. Uh, sorry, the Euclidean case, where here you would just put the uh, uh, the square of the Euclidean norm. Whether you add uh, a cubic term of course affects the scheme, but doesn't affect the final outcome, the limit, because it's, it's, a higher, it's a higher order term. And therefore, I mean, that's perhaps the easiest way, I'll put something which is uh, nicer, uh, that's the easiest way to see that uh, uh, that's not really, it doesn't really matter what exactly you put there, provided it has the right quadratic, uh, quadratic behavior. And, uh, and that's what this, uh, what this term achieves. achieves. But, uh, uh, but, uh, but also, you know, thresholding does that, but it does that in a kind of, uh, because it doesn't start out variationally, it does that in a, in a multitude of ways. So, uh, so there is a lemma uh, which, uh, uh, which then must be uh, lemma nine or so, uh, which uh, which reads as follows. So, if um, uh, so, in our in our notation, uh, provided um, uh, we have uh, so provided we uh, uh, provided uh, uh, we have a sequence. Now you can fix time, uh, which converges strongly in L1, and uh, for which uh, uh, you have um, this uh, convergence of the parameters. So provide under these assumptions, uh, provi so provided uh, uh, this holds, um, so provided that. Uh, we have, um, first of all, that the, um, and remember that this here essentially was uh, up to the factor C0, uh, the, uh, the parameter. We have that the localized energy functionals, so that would be, uh, uh, the local, uh, that would be just seeing this term because of these two others vanish. Uh, this converges to uh, C0 zeta times grad chi, but more importantly, uh, the first variations 
um, of, um, uh, of uh, such a configuration in direction of a vector field converges to the first variation uh, of um, um, the limiting configuration, which is a classical object in differential geometry, and I wrote it down already many times. It's the uh, uh, integrating the, I don't, probably you can't see that. Um, Uh, which is um, C0, the tangential divergence integrated over the interface, which is, I mean, the weak formulation of, uh, of mean curvature. So, uh, so this, is, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this, is a, this is a type of lemma that's uh, uh, well appreciated in kind of the phase field theory. So. Uh, kind of, if, if it were not uh, uh, this type of approximation coming uh, coming from uh, uh, coming from minimizing movements, but if it were the Ginzburg-Landau functional, then this could be uh, credited to uh, uh, um, Lukhaus and Modica. And and they essentially name uh, always say that this is a Reshetniak uh, uh, type uh, argument. So, uh, um, right, so there is this, there, there is this statement, and for the, that's exactly the statement for which you need the convergence assumption. The convergence assumption, if you have it globally, it also localizes. That's not so surprising. That's just kind of additivity and, uh, and the fact that you always have, has, have lower semi-continuity. But more importantly, you also have convergence of the first variation. And, uh, and that's, in a, in a certain sense, the only way we use this assumption because it guarantees uh, convergence of the first variation. And, uh, and the two lemmas, which I showed towards the end of uh, 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 this morning, exactly, sh I mean, made it clear that the problem reduces to studying the first variation. So that would be, that would be the only place where we need the... Uh, essentially the only place where we need the convergence assumption. More questions? Okay, so let's, uh, let's, uh, Recap, so, uh, okay, so uh, I'm repeating myself, but I was told that uh, it's good teaching to repeat things. So, uh, uh, so the, uh, uh, this completely abstract uh, uh, observation by De Giorgi uh, kind of gets you the right, gets you the missing term, uh, the missing term in the, uh, in the uh, uh, dissipation inequality at the expense of having to introduce a somewhat non-standard interpolation between the time steps. Uh, this what's called variational interpolation, and at the expense of having to introduce a non-Euclidean, non-Riemannian notion of uh, the square of a slope of a function, which, uh, uh, but which in the end is completely natural from the point of view of difference questions. So, uh, so that's really kind of the key theoretical idea, and, uh, uh, and it was uh, uh, completely uh, elementary and tremendously elegant. Um, right, and, uh, and here's, uh, here's, the, uh, oops, here's, the, uh, here's the result. Uh, I think I, I already mentioned that. So uh, getting, uh, getting kind of, the goal is getting the uh, localized energy inequalities, the family of localized energy inequalities with the right constant. And, uh, and for this, uh, we, uh, we, d we show on the basis of the thresholding formulation itself that, uh, thresholding, that the thresholding scheme uh, doesn't just satisfy the standard minimizing movement formulation, but also satisfies uh, kind of this localized minimizing movement formulation. And, uh, and that allows us to use uh, the Georgie 
de Georgi's abstract result in a slightly, uh, perhaps slightly more general framework than he originally conceived, namely where the, uh, this energy functional uh, also depends on the previous time step, but there's no problem with this. And then uh, summing up, uh, uh, one gets in a certain sense already the exact discrete version of uh, what you want to get in the end. So in a certain sense, I mean, you may see this, this in a certain sense is really like numerical analysis. You're showing, it's, uh, you're showing that thresholding is a geometric integrate. I mean, it has a good geometric properties, right? I mean, that's what people in numerical analysis are after. They want to find uh, discretizations that preserve as much uh, the underlying properties of the continuum equations. And that's what then called geometric integrators when it's about uh, kind of uh, conservative dynamics, and, uh, and now this is showing that, uh, that from the point of view of gradient flow dynamics, um, this, uh, um, uh, this, uh, this method by, um, uh, th this, the thresholding method actually has this nice method. And it's a bit, I mean, as I said, I mean, for many years it was realized and used that, uh, that thresholding is wonderfully compatible with the comparison principle, and. Uh, with, uh, and thus uh, kind of nicely, very elegantly connects with, uh, with viscosity solutions, but I would claim it as elegantly connects with, uh, with the gradient flow structure and, uh, and, and kind of the underlying variational principles as, 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 as this, uh, this result shows. So now, now so it's, uh, it's really just a matter of passing to, uh, to the limits, uh, term by term, black into black, uh, uh, green into green and red into red uh, from, uh, from the discre discretized version of, uh, uh, of the dissipation inequality to the right version of the dissipation inequality. And so in the black terms, uh, that's, I mean, that's just, I mean, that's just sitting here. Uh, and uh, uh, for the initial data anyway, it, you know, it's the assumption of well-prepared initial data if you want. And now we have to worry about the green and the uh, and the red terms, and that was uh, what, uh, what lemma seven was for. Uh, so lemma seven, so there, there is an abstract feature to lemma seven, namely that, uh, uh, that the metric slope, uh, this general metric notion by De Georgi, uh, in a certain sense controls a norm of the total variation uh, with respect to this, uh, this infinitesimal part of the metric, which looks a little bit like this. So, uh, which just give, you know, which again is kind of the main advantage of this De Georgi formulation that uh, it lends itself to lower semi-continuity methods to uh, uh, this type of arguments. So, uh, uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's what we use. So that makes the connection between the metric slope or the square of the metric slope and the classical first variation, so the infinitesimal uh, change if you flow your configuration by a vector field psi. And, uh, and then on the level of the infinitesimal for formulation, uh, the main insight is that uh, uh, this localization and taking the first variation commute. So whether you take the first variation uh, of your localized energy functional or you take the first variation uh, of your non-localized energy functional, but localizing the vector field it gives you the same result, up to an error that goes to zero as h goes to uh, h goes to zero. So, uh, so and, and you saw the proof, and essentially was completely uh, elementary. And uh, and slightly uh, slightly more subtle is is the uh, uh, the passage uh, to the limit in the term that uh, gives you this uh, transport term in the Braque formulation. Uh, so uh, uh, the term which arises from the fact that your energy functional has now two entries, not just uh, the usual one, but also the one which, is the, you know, which comes from the placeholder from the previous time steps, and that the difference quotient uh, of this expression uh, can be related to the first variation of the metric, the non-localized metric in direction of the gradient of the localization function. And then you can use the Euler-Lagrange equation of... Uh, uh, of the uh, unlocalized variational principle to also kind of uh, bring back this term to the first variation of the energy. So, uh, 
So in the end, in order to understand both uh, the term which comes from the metri metric slope and the term which comes from here, you're, you have to understand, uh, you have to pass to the limit in the first variation, and that's what I wrote down here. We can pass to, thanks to the convergence assumption, we can pass to the limit in the, uh, in the first variation. So these two lemmas reduce everything to, uh, to, passage, to the passage to the limit in the first variation. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the, that's the, uh, that's the story now. Okay, so what, uh, what do you want me to do? Uh, I can either, uh, so one option would be lemma six, one option would be lemma eight, uh, uh, one option would be going back to what I did on the first day. So who's in favor of lemma eight? Three, who's in favor of lemma six? Most of the people have given up. So uh, three in favor of uh, lemma, uh, uh, lemma eight, okay. Uh, so, so that was lemma eight, yes, right. So uh, uh, did I get it correctly? Yeah, I first asked for lemma eight, sorry? No, 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 but I first asked for lemma eight, right? Yeah, so. Okay, then let's, um, let's do lemma eight. And um, uh, so uh, um, yeah, that's what we have to do. And essentially, it uh, and let me tr uh, let me start with this. It relies on. Uh, a higher order expansion of the commutator. That sounds fancy, but it's elementary. And so uh, what we need is uh, that um, if you uh, look at the, uh, no, I was right the other way around. If you look at the, uh, at the commutator between <coughs> multiplication with the cutoff function zeta and the convolution with the heat kernel, and you apply it to some uh, test function v, uh, then uh, this is equal to minus h uh, gradient uh, gh convolved with uh, gradient zeta, and let me write like this, v uh, gradient zeta. That's the first term, and the second term is plus h over 2 um, gh times identity plus h times the hessian of the heat kernel uh, convolved with v second derivatives of zeta plus a term which is of order uh, three to the h to the power three halves uh, the uh, L infinity norm of the third derivatives of the cutoff function and the L infinity norm of V. And, uh, and we need uh, something to uh, some order less, uh, but uh, where we organize this differently by putting, by pulling uh, the gradient of zeta out of the convolution. So this is Like this, and then uh, obviously we get an order which order which is uh, error which is of the order h uh, uh, second derivatives uh, v infinity. So uh, uh, so that's elementary calculus, uh, very much like uh, uh, like what we uh, uh, what we did before when looking at the commutator, writing this uh, as uh, uh, writing it out. And uh, uh, the only additional, um, so the argument for one, uh, the only additional feature is that uh, because we're dealing with the heat kernel, we have some explicit formulas. Namely, uh, so re let's uh, recall that the uh, heat kernel is of the form 
is of Gaussian form. And uh, therefore, uh, the derivative uh, of the uh, heat kernel uh, gives you uh, the uh, first moment. with a minus sign, and the Hessian uh, of the heat kernel gives you um, um, essentially the second moment. And now you can use this to uh, uh, write uh, 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 GH times, or um, Z times GH as minus uh, H times Gret GH of Z. And this is the origin of this term because from expansion, you uh, from Taylor expanding Zeta, you would get uh, uh, from the first order term, you would get Z. But then you rewrite it in terms of the gradient. And uh, here you do a similar thing uh, from the second order, order term in the Taylor expansion of Zeta, uh, you would get. Um, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, term here, which according to this formula you can write as uh, um, h times uh, g, uh, g of h z times identity plus the Hessian of g h z, and that's uh, that's at the origin of this term. So uh, so essentially it's just uh, it's just uh, Taylor Taylor's expansion on zeta based on the fact that the, uh, uh, that what we used before lunch, uh, that, the, uh, that the commutator has this uh, uh, convenient integral uh, uh, representation. And now you use Taylor on this, and in fact, you use it in the form you write this as x minus z plus z minus x minus z. So you do Taylor around x minus z. And that gives you uh, uh, the gradient of zeta inside the convolution. But on the other hand, if you do Taylor around x, uh, that gives you the gradient of zeta outside of the convolution, like here. So, uh, so that, that's just elementary real, uh, real analysis uh, that uh, that you uh, uh, you can deal with these uh, with these commutators, and uh, now the um, from this uh, in the second step you get uh, something which is in between. Uh, uh, a representation and an error estimate. Uh, plus one half times the uh, first variation of the non-localized uh, metric in the configuration U in direction of gradient of zeta. So that's what uh, that's what we want to be sh what we want to show what we want uh, uh, to be small, and the representation is that this can be written as uh, such a good term, then the term which is uh, comes from here, uh, G H times identity plus H times um, Hessian convolved with one minus U times the Hessian of the cutoff plus uh, something which is of the order of the third derivatives of the cutoff function times the um, L1 distance of U and Xi plus or minus, if my notes are correct, uh, one quarter g h over two minus chi square Laplacian zeta plus uh, 
this in a return. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the second claim, and from this claim we, uh, we then will um, quickly get the estimate. So that's the, in a certain sense, that's the main part. It just, uh, it uses the definitions, and it uh, uses this expansion. So let's, uh, let's see how, how to get this. Okay, so uh, let's look at the uh, let's look at the uh, kind of uh, the uh, the difference quotient of uh, this object in the second variable, right? So uh, um, clearly, this term drops out. The lead, what we would think of the leading order term drops out because it doesn't depend on chi. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the contributions of the second term when these two things are equal, uh, these things are not there. So uh, what we're left with is uh, is just uh, um, is just these two contributions, and I'm going to put the one over h uh, inside. So we get uh, u minus zeta, 1 over h, the commutator of uh, gh, uh, applied to 1 minus chi, uh, plus u minus chi, um, 1 over h, the commutator of zeta with half of the uh, kernel, and the second half of the kernel is still sitting on u minus h, which is nice. Okay, so that's, uh, that's this expression. And um, now for the second expression for, uh, so that's taking, uh, that's, taking the, uh, that's taking the first variation of this, uh, uh, of this thing here. Uh, so as we see from here, this is a kind of a, a symmetric uh, bilinear expression. So if we take the derivative, we get a factor of two, and we can put the derivative uh, uh, in here. Uh, uh, but there is one half in front of it, so that the factor of two goes away. So uh, we get uh, a plus. Uh, then we get, uh, there is still the one over h in front of everything, uh, plus uh, u minus chi, uh, gh convolved with minus uh, psi grad uh, u. And let me put this minus here. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what we get from just plugging in the definitions. And, uh, and this is not uh, zeta, but psi. And because the zeta is sitting there. And uh, now uh, I claim, uh, and you tell me why, uh, that I can put, I can substitute the chi by u. Why can I do that? It looks like cheating. Why, uh, why can I, why can I, uh, why can I replace the chi by u there? So in other words, uh, why does the contribution from u minus chi, uh, one over h, zeta, gh, uh, u minus chi, why does the contribution, uh, why is the contribution of this one zero? Because that's the difference between the two terms.
Ja, ja, ja. So it's an argument we already had uh, before the uh, before the break. So uh, so why is uh, so we have a term of this form? Why does this integral vanish? Exactly right because. Uh, uh, because uh, I mean, uh, this is uh, this is this expression. I mean, so I mean, the abstract uh, the abstract formulation is A and B are two symmetric operators. So uh, the dual of uh, uh, of um, of the commutator uh, here. I've just plugged in the definition of the commutator. Now I use the fact that dualization changes the order. Now I'm using that individually these operators are symmetric. And then you see that this is uh, uh, um, equal, uh, equal to that, uh, which, uh, which just tells you that, this, uh, this, uh, that the commutator of two symmetric operators is anti-symmetric. So this exp in particular, this expression vanishes. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, multiplication with a function is symmetric, and convolution with our Gaussian is symmetric because the Gaussian is an even, even function. So, uh, so therefore, uh, therefore, uh, I can do that. Uh, okay. So uh, that simplifies uh, simplifies it a little bit because so now I can put one minus u here. And I want also to put one minus u here. Since there is a gradient, I can do that at uh, no expense, provided I change the sign here. Hopefully, I will have the right signs in the end. Because now I can compare, I can kind of combine this uh, first and the last term. So uh, these two terms combined uh, are uh, u minus chi, and then I get uh, 1 over h, the commutator, uh, plus gh psi gradient. And uh, both of this apply to uh, 1 minus u. And, uh, and that's. Uh, that's the first bit in this expansion uh, with, uh, am I doing something correctly here? Ah, sorry, yeah, so I made, uh, so I want, to, I want to take the first variation not in, in, in direction of a general vector field psi, but in direction of the gradient uh, zeta. So we have this expression here. And now you see that, uh, that this term exactly is, uh, are these two things here with V playing the role of 1 minus U. So uh, this term here is equal to H over 2, uh, GH identity plus the Hessian GH uh, convolved with um, 1 minus U times the Hessian of the cutter function zeta plus uh, an error which is of the order h3 over 2, uh, the L infinity norm of uh, the third derivatives of the cutter function, and the L infinity norm of 1 minus u, which is equal to 1. So uh, uh, we should see now that this error term gives rise to this term here. Because, uh, right, I forgot the, uh, there's a u minus chi sitting in front of everything. So u minus chi 
is here, and there we have the third derivative of the cutoff function. And, uh, and this term here uh, gives rise to this term, uh, and I made a mistake here, that should be h over two, because this is not exactly this term, but I'm using the semi-group property of writing this term as g of h over two uh, convolved with uh, g of h over two identity plus h gradient squared h over two. So I can factorize this convolution operator into two convolution operators by the semi-group property, and the first factor I bring on the first, uh, the first uh, factor I bring on the first factor in this product, and that's sitting here. So uh, we also have this term. And, uh, uh, and now we're still left with this one here. And that's where we use the, uh, the second, uh, uh, the second, uh, uh, the second somewhat easier relation here. So now I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at this term here. And uh, so one of the square root of h uh, u minus chi, um, one over h, commutator of zeta, g h over two, uh, g h over two. Excuse me, u minus chi. So that's uh, that's the uh, that's the blue term which I've copied, and uh, now I'm using uh, this formula. So uh, this is equal to uh, uh, minus the gradient of zeta, uh, ah, so here I have to use this for h over two, nothing easier than that. So h over two, h over two, two h, doesn't matter. So uh, here we have minus, uh, minus two times g h over two convolved uh, with whatever I have there g h over two u minus chi. Okay, am I happy with this? Uh, perhaps not quite. Um, I would have, uh, I would have, perhaps I would have preferred to have this in the other place. all not changing this here so that I was I mean if I do it if I do it uh, let's for a moment think I did it like this one here then uh, this would read uh, minus 2 gradient g h over 2 gradient zeta uh, uh, g h over 2 u minus zeta, and uh, now I could bring, uh, yeah, that's better. So now I can bring this here on the first factor, and then I can use Leibniz rule. So, sorry, so that would have been, uh, that would have been slightly smarter. I mean, uh, shorter, more elegant, anyway, to keep it like the upper one. So then I'm, using this, so minus two, the one over h kills the h, gradient g over two, uh, uh, um, I'm not sure whether, <laughs> whether I'm just confusing myself, h over two, u minus chi, that plays the role of v, and then we have gradient of zeta, uh, no. No, it was better before. Okay. Minus 2 over h, grad g over uh, grad zeta, grad g over h, v, minus 2 grad zeta, grad g 
over h, or perhaps I'm missing a small additional argument. I thought it, I could do it without any further work. Yeah, okay, so that, that, no, that, that what I wrote down is stupid. With, with my counting that, uh, with my understanding that an operator acts on everything what comes behind, uh, I shouldn't write it like this. I should write it, uh, I should write, I should put the gradient first and then the second convolution. So I should write it like this. So I'm confusing myself with my efficient notation without taking records, so that would be, that would be the correct interpretation of this here. And uh, now I can uh, move this on the other side, minus two over square root of h, uh, gradient gh over two convolved with u minus chi. Uh, um, gradient of zeta, gh over two, u minus chi, okay? So, uh, and now I can combine these two things by Leibniz rule to uh, the uh, gradient of uh, um, one half gh over two u minus chi um, squared. And then I can uh, do another integration by parts where I put this gradient onto uh, that gradient getting uh, Laplacian. So this is equal to uh, uh, one over square root of h um, Laplacian zeta gh over two convolved with u minus chi squared. So uh, which uh, up to the strange factor of one quarter, which I got there, and up to a, a wrong sign, uh, which uh, I'm not quite sure whether, ah, yeah, so the, the sign is not wrong because uh, this, uh, this kernel is anti-symmetric. So uh, there is a change of sign if I bring it on the other side. Uh, so there is a minus sign here. So that means this minus sign is correct, but now the one quarter, why? So h over, two, why did I put two h here? Uh, that should have been h over two. So because I'm just stupidly substituting h by h over two, uh, then I'm dividing by h, so there's a one half. So I get a one half here and another one half, so. That's perfectly correct. And uh, okay, so that's correct. And then there is this, uh, there is this error term plus uh, order h times second derivatives of the cutoff function times the L infinity norm of this guy, which is certainly controlled by one. Uh, so that gets multiplied. Ah, okay, no, before doing this, um, before doing this, uh, and I'm not going to, I'm just going to say it in words, it's better to, uh, it's better to uh, uh, change, uh, change the order here. So uh, um, put, this, uh, put this thing with a minus sign on the first factor so that you kind of get, that you can free this, uh, uh, this beneficial term, which still has part, uh, part this convolution so that you get the L infinity norm of this uh, times um, uh, not the L1 norm of u minus chi, but the convolution of u minus chi. So, uh, so that requires once using one, one, one more using kind of symmetry or anti-symmetry. And the uh, factors of h are correct because this one's gone because of one over h. This one's gone, so there's no h here, and there's one over square root of h which is uh, still sitting here. Okay, so, so that, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the argument for two. And uh, so now we don't need this anymore. And now the estimate is, uh, is easy.
So the third step is the conclusion. Um, so how are we going to estimate these terms? Um, so for the first term, we use Cauchy-Schwarz in order to get the uh, metric here. And uh, this second term is certainly estimated in L. So this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is because thanks to the H here, this is an L1 kernel with an L1 norm that's uh, of order one. Uh, this is uh, an L infinity, so we get the L2 norm of the cutoff function, which of the second derivative, so we take the L infinity norm. So that term is fine and gives rise The first term would give rise to uh, um, the metric term uh, square root. There is still a one over square root of h in front of it, and then we have the uh, uh, L infinity norm of the cutoff function, where we're being very generous. Uh, that's uh, exactly the same term which we anyway have here already. And now we have to look at this term, uh, but in this term, uh, we just pull out the L infinity norm. This time we need the L infinity norm of the second derivative, zeta. So uh, there is a one over square root of h, gh over two u minus chi squared times the L infinity norm of the second derivative, zeta. And, uh, and then there is this term here. Uh, plus one over, no, uh, sorry, there is uh, uh, this term without any bad H, but no convolution and third derivatives of zeta. Okay, so, uh, uh, so this here is just uh, by definition uh, one, or with the uh, one over H, by definition, d square u chi over h, uh, perhaps with a factor of two, or one half, right? That's, that's just the definition. So that, uh, uh, that's uh, the, um, that's this error term, which is kind of small, and uh, this term here then goes like uh, one over square root of h is sitting here, and then here you have uh, another one over, uh, ah, so uh, this, uh, this thing here goes like uh, uh, one over, or is equal to one over two square root of h uh, d square u chi, but then I'm taking the square root. That's the first term. And that gives one over h three over four, uh, which up there I wrote as uh, d over h times h one quarter to highlight that this also goes to zero. And now for this term, we're using our very first uh, lemma one. Uh, or lemma, no, it wasn't lemma one, but it was, uh, it was this estimate here. Which, uh, uh, which controls, uh, uh, which controls uh, such a, so here we use, let's say we use Cauchy-Schwarz at first, and then we use uh, lemma for third, uh, second point, and that, uh, uh, that gives rise to another metric term which is smaller and this energetic term, or rather the square root of this energetic term, and that's, uh, that's this term here. Okay, so uh, uh, perhaps there is an H one quarter that might be typo. So anyway, so uh, so these things go to zero. Okay, so that uh, that uh, that shows the uh, the argument. Perhaps that's the most. I would say this is the. I mean, in terms of length, this is the most involved uh, involved argument in the paper, proving uh, proving this estimate. How much time do I still have? Am I done? Ten minutes. Okay, so uh, um, in principle, uh, ah, so I can still, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I could 
finish the proof of lemma six, but I could also answer questions. I'm happier answering questions than doing lemma six. I mean, you get it anyway. Uh, so, but if you don't have questions, then I can either stop, which I wouldn't unhappy, be unhappy about, uh, or I can do lemma six. Yes. There is, uh, I think there's recent work by, uh, if I understand, I mean, uh, uh, to my knowledge, I mean, to best of my knowledge, there's recent work by Aaron Yip and his former PhD student, Drew Schwartz, who showed that um, if uh, mean curvature flow, I think that, but they looked at the single phase case, if mean curvature, f as long as mean curvature flow is smooth, thresholding converges nicely to that smooth solution. So this type of, this type of result, uh, uh, is, I mean, this type of, let's say, more classical result now is, uh, seems to be around two. I don't know whether that's what you were referring to. Maybe I, mean, I guess the question was the more regular things that they Okay, so, so, uh, uh, so if the flow is regular, then so the global, I mean, just the global energy inequality, I mean, for, for a smoothly evolving surface, which is a priori unrelated to mean curvature flow, the global energy inequality cannot characterize the evolution because in a certain sense, it's just a single scalar equation. And so just by dimensional arguments, it couldn't give you that information. Uh, perhaps you're familiar with these rate independent evolutions uh, uh, where uh, the situation is slightly different. Uh, you have kind of a local minimization problem, and in this case, uh, because you have additional information, a global energy identity can characterize, uh, at least formally, the, the evolution, but here it's clear that it wouldn't be enough. So, so you really need, I mean, and that's Bracke's observation, you really need kind of this entire family. But then it's a, for, I mean, it's an easy formal consideration that uh, uh, provided the uh, evolution is smooth, but a priori unrelated to, uh, um, uh, to mean curvature, and it satisfies this family of inequalities, then it must be mean curvature. That's, I mean, the three-line observation. More questions? Yes. So, so the short answer is no. And, uh, and in principle, that's a question which I have been thinking about uh, for many years. I mean, you must be familiar with the fact that uh, um, uh, grain growth in so multi-phase mean curvature flow, network flow in, uh, in let's say, uh, uh, the uh, extended space, uh, generically is expected to be statistically self-similar, where uh, the uh, number density in two dimensions, the number density of grains decays like one of a square root of t, the typical size of the grains, or one of a t, the typical size of the grains goes up like t uh, one half. So you would expect these to see, and in numerical simulations, and I guess in experiments, you see these robust scaling laws through this cascade of uh, grains vanishing, exchange of neighborhoods. and. Uh, and with, um, with Bob Cohn, uh, 15 years ago or so, we came up with a method which in principle can give upper bounds for coarsening rates. And uh, based on the gradient flow structure and based on kind of a global property of the energy landscape. And, uh, and we worked this out, I mean, worked out successfully for Khan Hilliard and the kind of sharp interface version, which is Malin Sikirka and for 
uh, surface diffusion, uh, so degenerate Kahn Hilliard, but we never got to work it for, uh, we, get an, we de never got to work it here. So uh, uh, that's something I would be very interested in kind of saying, uh, giving kind of these soft types of uh, statistical statements on, uh, on generic evolutions, also here, but, uh, I, but I haven't made, recently I haven't made the connection between these results and what we were thinking of before. So the short answer, as I said, was no. Okay, I'm looking, I'm looking at Nicola. Nicola. I mean, uh, 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 Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with Nicola. Uh, so, so I mean, here I I, I, uh, I was very happy that uh, that this uh, this abstract theory kind of nicely applies, and uh, uh, um, I think uh, I think this uh, this abstract theory of doing analysis in metric spaces, um, I mean, is interesting by itself, of course, but also uh, um, when you um, uh, in a certain sense, sometimes it's interesting to develop analysis on potential limiting objects, right? If you want to give co convenient uh, indirect proofs like we're used in geometric analysis, blow up and so, then it's good to understand the objects which could arise as potential blow ups. And, and often you lose some structure, but if you have certain curvature bounds, you perhaps don't lose all structures and you certainly retain sometimes something which is better characterized as a metric structure. And so, uh, so I think in these more pure areas of geometry, or geometric analysis, it certainly has, it certainly uh, is, is very, uh, very smart to, uh, uh, to work in, in, in such a general. Fr now, from the point of view of applied analysis, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit less clear, but, uh, but as Nicola said, uh, um, it, gives, uh, uh, it gives, sometimes it gives the proofs from the book, right? Because, uh, you, you have so little objects that you have to find the most efficient proof. More questions? Yes. That, that could be conceivable, but in a certain sense, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm I, I mean, from an numerical point of view, of course, I would not necessarily advocate using uh, 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 the minimizing movement scheme with the Wasserstein distance as a smart way to solve the parabolic equation. I don't think that this is, I mean, they're very efficient way. I, I, I mean, personally, of course, I like this. But, uh, but uh, I don't think that this is necessarily the, uh, uh, from an numerical point of view, the, the, best, way, the best way to do it. Yeah. But, but in general, of course, you're right. I mean, uh, when you have a, uh, when, um, uh, when you want to solve, uh, um, in some sense, you may say that uh, the, the numerical idea of preconditioning 
is goes a little bit in that direction, kind of uh, taking uh, when you when you do steepest descent and you uh, you have a steepest descent algorithm, and now you want to do that in a numerically efficient way, uh, you can choose your metric in a way that suits you, which uh, numeric, numerical people would, you know, rather address to as a, as a, as a smart way of preconditioning. So, uh, so there are certainly, uh, certainly numerical situations where you play with this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so fourth order equations, uh, of course, I mean, if you think now of the thin film equation, have their special problems because they, uh, near the contact line, they have a, a very intrinsic singular behavior. Uh, so again, I'm not sure whether um, these variational schemes are, are kind of the best, but yeah, why not? I haven't, I'm, short answer is, I don't know, interesting question. 